Thank you very much indeed. Um, the lecture is entitled The Eucharist and Poverty, and it has a subtitle. Uh, the subtitle is Learning from the Conversion of Fray Bartolomé de las Casas. The World Summit on Social Development concluded that poverty is a condition characterized by severe deprivation of basic human needs, including food, safe drinking water, sanitation facilities, health, shelter, education, and information. Poverty depends not only on income, but also on access to services. It includes a lack of income and productive resources to ensure sustainable livelihoods, hunger and malnutrition, ill health, limited or lack of access to education and other basic services, increased morbidity and mortality from illness, homelessness and inadequate housing, unsafe environments and social discrimination and exclusion. It is also characterized by lack of participation in decision making and in civil, social and cultural life. It occurs in all countries as mass poverty in many developing countries pockets and poverty amid wealth and in developed countries, loss of livelihoods as a result of economic recession, sudden poverty as a result of disaster or conflict, the poverty of low-wage workers, and the utter destitution of people who fall outside family-supported systems, social institutions, and safety nets. The World Health Organization states that hunger, disease, and less education describe a person in poverty. One third of deaths, some 18 million people a year, or 50,000 per day, are due to poverty-related causes. In total, 270 million people, most of them women and children, have died as a result of poverty since 1990. Those living in poverty suffer disproportionately from hunger or even starvation and disease. Those living in poverty suffer lower life expectancy. According to the World Health <coughs> Organization, hunger and malnutrition are the single gravest threats to the world's public health, and malnutrition is by far the biggest contributor to child mortality, present in half of all cases. What this reality of poverty, hunger, discrimination, exploitation, and lack of opportunities mean to a Eucharistic theology? In light of the life and thought of our Dominican brother Bartolomé de las Casas, what can we learn about the, these interrelated matters on poverty with all its consequences and the main message of the meaning of the Eucharist? In this presentation, I will briefly look at both the historical context of Bartolomé de las Casas and his main ideas in order to shed light on our understanding of the Eucharist in the midst of this reality of the world's poverty and hunger. European Christianity arrived in Latin America in, 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 in 1492 when Christopher Columbus first set foot on these lands. Since then, Latin American Catholicism has become a contradictory sign of hope and oppression as expressed in the Fourth General Conference of Latin American Bishops in Santo Domingo. In 1989, the Pontifical Commission for Justice and Peace had already acknowledged European domination and destruction, and I quote them, the first great wave of European colonization was indeed accompanied by a massive destruction of the pre-Columbian civilizations in a brutal subjugation of their populations. Soldiers and trade killed to establish themselves 
in order to profit from the labor of indigenous population and later of black people, reducing them to slavery. End of quote. In Ecclesia in America, John Paul II calls the Amerindian cultures the seeds of divine world. However, few seeds remain after the dreadful invasion of the Latin American lands and people. With the arrival of the Europeans, cultures and powers collided, cosmologies clashed, particularly the Amerindian cosmologies were systematically obliterated. The Spaniards and the Portuguese found three major centers of political and religious power, the Mayans, the Aztecs, and the Incas. Great temples and cities had already been built in Peru, Argentina, the Olmec region, the Mayan region, and the Toltec regions, which later became the great Aztec Empire. These cities were cultural centers in which religious ceremonies, political and artistic activities, trade or mercados, and civil, religious, and military education took place. Integrating learning, integrating mind, body, spirit, and heart, played an important role in the shaping of these communities. With the arrival of Christendom, the greatness and sophistication of these centers of power came under attack. Many cities were partially or totally destroyed. The indigenous people were cruelly humiliated, tortured, killed, and the survivors who could not escape were imprisoned or enslaved. Women were often raped and killed by the conquistadores. In addition to the genocide, many fell ill and often died from epidemic brought by Europeans. Leonardo Boff and Virgilio Elizondo thus illustrate the devastation the Aztecs suffered, and I quote them. Of the 22 million Aztecs in 1519, when Hernán Cortés entered Mexico, only a million were left in 1600, end of quote. The entry of Catholicism in the so-called New World left profound wounds. The Mayan sacred text, the Shilam Balam, the Shumayel avows, and I quote, sadness was brought among us, Christianity was brought among us. This was the beginning of our distress, the beginning of a slavery, end of quote. The sign of the cross that the first missionaries brought to the Americas became the mark of the crucified people <coughs> who at first were the indigenous people but later included African slaves. More than 500 years later, the crucified people are still poor and outcast and include indigenous people and a great number of people of African descent. From the perspective of the invaders, the Catholicism brought to the New World was the result of a long historical project of expanding Western Christendom, which by the late 15th century reached a peak, particularly with the strengthening and the recentering of Western power around the Spanish and Portuguese empires. This project, linked with mercantile capitalism and the legalization of massive exploitation of labor to produce commodities for a newly global market was achieved by taking over lands and imposing a universal history of salvation under one religion. By the late 1500s, the church had allied and even identified with the state. It often approved of the mercantilist seal, slavery included, and joined the twofold project of evangelizing and civilizing a world beyond the Western borders. The Church granted legal powers to the Spanish and Portuguese crowns, allowing the monarchs to appoint bishops over the Latin American lands. The Church also accepted that the Spanish and Portuguese crowns create a system called encomiendas that granted the conquerors property rights and total management over the conquered lands including ownership over native slaves. <coughs>
With the rapid increase of epidemic illnesses and deaths, African slaves were brought to Latin America to labor in the new export-oriented planta plantations and mines. The weakening of the church vis-a-vis -vis these unjust moves granted the crown more power over the church. The Catholic Church often became complicit of the atrocities committed in this new world. To the eyes of many indigenous peoples and African slaves, the church was a part of the same dark power, the encomenderos. The dark origins of Latin American Catholicism coexist with seeds of light, hope, and liberation. By 1524, more systematic evangelization in Latin America was brought forth by Franciscan friars, followed by Dominicans, Augustinians, and later by Jesuits. New, new dioceses and archdioceses were formed, and the Catholic Church started to spread. Many friars learned native languages, studied the narratives, symbols, and rituals, and translated the Bible and catechism, and taught European languages to the native peoples and Africans. Some Dominican friars, like Anton de Montesinos, Francisco de Vitoria, and Bartolomé de las Casas himself, became strong defenders of the indigenous peoples and consistently denounced the cruelties and injustice committed against the people, God's children, to both civil and ecclesial authorities. In this new world, Catholic theology faced new questions regarding the methods, principles, and techniques for spreading Christianity in a non-Western world. At this point of the history of Western Christianity uh, and Western, Western Christian thought, the so-called beginnings of modernity, the natural, supernatural, body, soul, immanence, transcendence, divide, suffer a greater division, even antagonism, than that of the Middle Ages that emphasized the notion of participation and co-arising of parts, a more dynamic understanding of individuality and difference as being mutually constitutive. By the early modern Western col colonial construction of such a strong divide became the main justification for the exploitation of Amerindians and Africans who were considered soulless barbarians on the other side of civilization, that the sphere of the natural world that is to be dominated and eventually civilized. Preaching the Gospel requires facing these questions, and many missionaries and theologians started to articulate a vision of the Church that recognized the dignity of every single child of God and demanded respect for all cultures and lands. These exemplary missionaries and theologians often risked their reputation and became target of heavy criticism by Europeans within the Church and the state. At times, many of them were removed from their missions, and some even met death because of their alliance to the dispossessed people. Thus, at the same time as colonial and oppressive church was imposed upon the Latin American people, a new church integrated the voice of the new races, the voice of mestizaje, the racial interbreeding of European and Amerindians, and mulataje, African descent interbreeding, a voice committed to dialogue and reciprocal exchange, a voice of liberation to the voiceless. This prophetic voice was first pronounced in Latin America by the Dominican Anton de Montesino, the Montesinos, who in his 1511 sermon used the same words as John the Baptist, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. For sure, when Bartolomé de las Casas arrived in Latin America in 1502, he heard loud cries in, in this wilderness. He was the first secular priest ordained in the New World. He met the Dominicans Pedro de Córdoba and Anton de Montesinos and was really impressed by them, particularly by their strong criticism against the Spanish conquistadores. In 1513, he was sent to Cuba and was given slaves, becoming an encomendero. 
His well-known prophetic conversion in 1514 is related in his Historia de las Indias. While Bartolomé de las Casas was preparing for Mass, he was struck by the reading of the book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 34, that reads, and I quote, A sacrifice derived from ill-gotten gains is contaminated, a lawless mockery that cannot win approval. The Most High is not pleased with the offering of the godless, nor do endless sacrifices win his forgiveness. To offer a sacrifice from the possession of the poor is like killing a son before his father's eyes. Bread is life to the destitute, and it is murder to deprive them of it. To rob your neighbor of his livelihood is to kill him, and the man who cheats a worker of his wages sheds blood." End of quote. He was unable to say the Mass to the encomenderos and decided to free his own slaves and then joined the Dominicans and began his prophetic preaching both in the New World and in Spain. Bartolomé de las Casas realized that slavery and colonial power unjustly took away the most basic human rights of the indigenous people, transforming a divine economy into a sinister economy of greed, power, and domination. I suggest that this reading could tell us something about the main features in de las Casas' Eucharistic theology and his realization that the Eucharist is not a private rite, but a public and communal performance that challenges the powers of the world, including its economic order. The bread and wine offered at the altar are the product of human labor, which then become Christ's own body and blood. Herein there is an economy, that is, a Trinitarian economy, wherein the gift is first given by God to creation, which is then transformed by human labor, so that at the altar it is furthermore transformed as Christ self-giving to the Church, offering this same gift to the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Eucharist tells us of God's presence in the world as the creator of all, but it is also the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ and the continuous mysterious presence of the Holy Spirit. The incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ reveals God's radical love for humanity. But on the other hand, it also narrates a story of sin and violence, and the cross signifies these terrors, as Bartolomé de las Casas became well aware of. Nevertheless, the resurrection implies that violence and death is not the end of this narrative. The resurrection is not only a promise of life eternal, but also a reorientation of all creation to God's peace, love, and justice. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit is epiclesis, God's companionship, in the midst of the <coughs> ecclesial performing of God's reign. Therefore, the Eucharist shows a dynamic relationship of the economy, the circulation of the gift. But it is also political, or to be more precise, the Eucharist is both theological and political, or theopolitical, as William Kavanaugh puts it. I say theopolitical because politics here is not envisioned as an autonomous figure apart from God. My political perspective is fundamentally theological only because my understanding of the Greek term polis, a city or community embodying the fulfillment of human social relations, is intrinsically derived from a vision of divine sharing, a co-abiding in the body of Christ in which, and which constitutes the ecclesial body, a divine human body politics. Just as humanity does not have a body, but is a body, the Church, James Smith rightly points out, does not have a politic, but it is a politics. The Church expresses a corporate existence where divine agency interacts with human affairs 
and such an interaction nurtures, that is to say, gives life and shape to the ecclesial body. The theopolitics of Christ's body in the Eucharist is rooted not exclusively, exclusively upon power, but in a more primary sense, its root is divine caritas, which is expressed with a radical gesture of kenosis, reciprocity, and concrete communal practices. This is not to say that power is herein dismissed, or that the Eucharist is a sign of disempowerment. There is a, poli a politics of power here, yet it is a power that integrates plenitude of desire, the paradoxical force of sacrifice on the cross, the humble power of bread broken into pieces for the purpose of sharing. It is the washing of feet that means a life of service to one another. It is the power of giving life for the other. In other words, this is the theopolitical power of Caritas, where the <coughs> extraordinary embraces and transfigures the ordinary. God's sovereignty disclosed at the breaking of the bread. The Eucharist speaks of the body politics of co-abiding, the Father with the Holy Spirit in the Son, Christ in the Eucharistic elements and in the partaker, and the material elements as well as the partakers in Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Herein, in this complex co-abiding, lies the theopolitics of nourishment, which is endlessly enacted through this communal sharing in the body of Christ. The Eucharist reminds us that God is attentive to the most primary needs of his people, for he not only brings about physical and spiritual nourishment, but also incorporates the partakers into his own Trinitarian community. As God becomes spread from heaven in order to nourish and constitute his own body, so is the ecclesial community called to nourish one another. From an ecclesial perspective, founded upon the Eucharist, the public communal and celebratory circulation of the gift shapes the life of the body politics of the Church. In view of this sharing in the same divine body, the Eucharistic practice presents a great challenge both to the Church as well as to the entire world. Erico Joao James puts it quite functionally, and I quote him, Sharing at Jesus' table means extending it for more people, making a space for others to eat, finding fulfillment in setting the table for those who are hungry. The table extended in this way becomes a feast, a banquet, at which humankind and divine mystery mingle in mutual fellowship. End of quote. We no longer live in the same historical context of colonial power as Bartolomé de las Casas did. However, in our current increasingly hyper-capitalist globalized world, we experience a different kind of colonization. Few members of the world live in opulence, yet a great number of people live in extreme poverty. The problem is not so much a lack of resources, the real problem is human refusal to share and care for one another, particularly those who are in most need in our midst. A clear example of this is the realities of the world's hunger and malnutrition that are as pervasive as extreme poverty. More than one billion people subsist on less than one dollar a day, and more than 800 million people have too little to eat to meet their daily energy needs. The Eucharistic meal exposes these broken realities of our own eating practices. Massive food waste, labor exploitation, a new kind of slavery, and lack of an effective practice of sharing food with the neighbor. We must not forget that divine superabundance equals God's generosity and hospitality, and as such, it presents a challenge the greediness of capitalist consumerism. Thus, the Eucharist could serve as a counterpractice to this capitalist crafting of desire. The theopolitical practice is the Eucharistic Ecclesia 
orients and disciplines desires towards God and towards making communion with one another. We sometimes take it for granted that the Eucharist is a communal meal. It is the gift of Christ himself given to the others. So it is a gift meant not to be privately possessed, but to be shared among others. Bread and, blo and blood are metaphors for human life and sustenance. However, according to the reading of the Ecclesiasticus that so deeply struck Bartolomé de las Casas, bread in particular is the life of the destitute. When bread is taken away from the poor, and likewise when workers are abused, tortured, and killed, the offering at the altar becomes godless and idolatrous cult. I cannot but agree with Fray Beto, who in his essay entitled Zero Hunger, an Ethical Political Project, points out that alleviating hunger is not just the outcome of giving food to people or making donations, but it, is also, but it also requires a more holistic action that targets the structural change. And I quote Fray Beto, Hunger and poverty cannot be fought just through donations or even by transfer of funds. These need to be complemented by effective policies of a structural change, such, such as agrarian, agrarian and fiscal reforms that are capable of lessening the concentration of income from land and financial buildings. And all this has to be guaranteed by a dairy policy of loans and credit offer to the beneficiary families who must become the target of an intense educational program so that they can become socioeconomic units and active agents in political and historical processes." End of quote. Within a Eucharistic dynamic, the body politic of the Church is then centered on a practice of table fellowship, where sharing is an enactment of participation or co-belonging with one another, humanity with creation, and the whole creation with God. In this body and at this table, all members are interdependent. The ecclesial body enables us to reach beyond secular boundaries, where in the private and public, the political and the religious are often mutually antagonized. By embodying a participatory politics of God's kingdom, the ecclesial body can open up a space where everyone, particularly the outcast and the poor, are spiritually and physically nourished. In war and deed, Jesus Christ, the one who enjoys eating and drinking with the excluded ones, teaches us about a God who nourishes and who celebrates love and solidarity with humanity in the midst of a shared table. He teaches us to tenderly call God Abba, and as God's children, to ask the loving Father for our daily bread, our daily communal bread, el pan para todos, bread for everyone. Jesus Christ, the God human, is the master of desire, who incarnates God's own desire to feed all hungers, and who promises that the kingdom of heaven will be a lavish banquet, a big fiesta. The Christian narrative proclaims that after Jesus' ascension into heaven, God sends the Holy Spirit as donum, the procession of a divine gift that is a desire to practice reciprocity within an all-inclusive communal celebration, a practice already anticipated within the intra-Trinitarian community. In and with the Holy Spirit, Christianity learns that imitatio dei is, in fact, imitatio trinitatis. In and with the Holy Spirit, community already takes place here on earth at the locus of a collective table that offers solidarity to all, particularly to those who physically and spiritually most hunger in the world. Theology in general, and Eucharistic theology in particular, cannot be indifferent to the question of why there are so many people in the world who are malnourished and indeed star starving. Hunger has a physical and existential as well as an ethical political dimension. 
Humans are hungry beings, for without eating, we die of starvation. But hunger is also a reflection of ethics and politics, for it involves power <coughs> relations and the sharing, or the lack of sharing, of God's gifts. Bread and the lack thereof has to do with the power of sharing and the potential refusal to do just that. It is therefore a profoundly theological issue, for it has to do ultimately with God's gift and the sharing or refusal to share of this gift with one another. That is why the Zero Hunger Project has an act of commitment to ex that expresses the voice of dozens of religions, dominations, Christians and non-Christians, in the shared conviction that hunger results from injustice and represents an offense against the Creator, since life is the greatest gift of God. They also express their belief that to share bread is to share God. This implies that without God, the possibility of overcoming hunger does not exist. Intrinsic and not extrinsic to creation, there is God who share, whose sharing enacted in concrete human communities brings about nourishment. This is an, also another reason why an Eucharistic theology could be a counter-secular practice in the midst of a starving world, <coughs> devoid of God. The vocation of all Christians is to become Eucharistic people and in a way to embrace poverty as an imitation of Christ, that is, as an expression of love and solidarity to the poor, while simultaneously denouncing the injustice and exploitation to the poor and those who are hungry. Our Dominican brother, Gustavo Gutierrez, puts it in these words, and I quote him, Poverty is an act of love and liberation. It has a redemptive value. If the ultimate cause of human exploitation and alienation is selfishness, the deepest reason for voluntary poverty is love of neighbor. Christian poverty has a meaning only as a commitment of solidarity with the poor, with those who suffer misery and injustice. The commitment is to witness to the evil which has resulted from sin and is a violation of communion. It is not a question of idealizing poverty, but rather of taking it on as it is an evil to protest against it and to struggle to abolish it. As Paul Ricoeur says, you cannot really be with the poor unless you are struggling against poverty because of this solidarity which manifests itself in a specific action, a lifestyle, a break with one social class, one can also help the poor and exploited to become aware of their exploitation and seek liberation from it. Christian poverty and expression of love is solidarity with the poor and is a protest against poverty. This is the concrete, contemporary meaning of the witness of poverty. It is a poverty lived not for its own sake, but rather as an authentic imitation of Christ. It is a poverty which means taking on the sinful human condition to liberate humankind from sin and all its consequences." End of quote. The Eucharist enacts a communal body so that when one member of the body suffers, the whole body suffers as well, as expressed by St. Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12. Bartolomé de las Casas became aware of this ecclesial implication of the body of Christ and realized that the brutal exploitation of people was a counter-testimony of the body of Christ. With his conversion, Bartolomé de las Casas initiated an understanding of the Eucharist that calls to a constant discipline of metanoia a conversion of heart, to the point of becoming bread for one another, particularly becoming Eucharistic for those who are most vulnerable, for the poor and those who suffer in the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>
table, this communal table, <laughs> to, to share your own comments, your own questions, uh, and, and, and to start a dialogue um, here. <coughs> Start, start the ball rolling. Thank you very much. Very beautiful, and for the, the way in which you brought out the the dynamic of the gift and exchange within the Eucharistic relationship to our wider exchanges. Could I ask you to comment, though, within the ritualization of exchange within the Eucharist, which on the one hand is essential to its symbolic importance, mm -hmm. so on the second also seems sometimes to be able to help us compartmentalize badly and allows us to shut the doors that you have rightly kept open. Yes. And I just wonder if you could comment on that kind of twofold yes. good and bad aspect of ritualization. Yes. I, 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 I realize it's a very good question because I realize that uh, often the Eucharist can be fetishized and, 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 and creates a, that, this kind of dichotomy between the private cult and the private liturgies and the public life. So that uh, Catholics, Christians who go uh, to the liturgies and share the, and at the Eucharistic table, many times, very often, when they leave the church, they forget about it and they go into the public space and become something completely different. And I think the challenge of the Eucharist is that there is no longer this dichotomy between the private and the public, but the Eucharist becomes a public performance in a liturgical sense that shows us something about the public world. So that the Eucharist becomes a challenge to the economic structures of the world. And so I think, I think that we Catholics have to overcome this dichotomy, this fetishization of the Eucharist, and and, and realize and also practice a Eucharist not only in the liturgies but also bring it to our own everyday life and also uh, especially to bring uh, food to those who to most hunger in the world so that there is no longer this dichotomy between the liturgical world and the public space, space or the state and the church but it's actually to become it's a call to become Eucharistic people, as I said, no? It is, it's to become bread for one another. Sometimes bread, this bread is not, it's not necessarily the physical bread, sometimes it's just the, the being in, in, in love with one another, uh, practicing caritas, caritas with one another, forgiveness, and bring reconciliation and compassion. So I think that's another way of becoming Eucharistic to one another. Yes, thank you. I don't know if it's, the same experience of many other Christians and Catholics who also see this kind of dichotomy or two worlds between the liturgy and the public space. <coughs> and I think the Eucharist breaks with this, with this, uh, with these borders. Yes. Uh, a question from the biblical studies. Mm -hmm. uh, would you agree that there is a tension in First Corinthians 11 between the have and the have nots, between the poor and, and the rich? And if you do, um, how would you um, integrate uh, the way Paul this, uh, deals with this, uh, with this issue in your theology of food regarding the problem of poverty? Yes, well, I, I think in biblical, from, from a perspective of the Bible, there is always, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, uh, an encouragement of revelation of a God who reveals himself as the one who nourishes his people, so that God is always talking about and in favor of those who are poor. So there is, uh, in some way, uh, a preferential option if you want to use the liberation theology uh, kind of... Uh, um, words, uh, the way they put it, is a, a preferential option of God towards those who most suffer, towards those who, who are most poor, towards those who hunger. In the Old Testament, we learn that God nourishes his people, and we see constantly from the Genesis till, till all, all, the, all the scriptures in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, that God is constantly nourishing people, constantly aware of, of nourishing people. And it's more radicalized in the New Testament because not only God is uh, nourishes people, but God becomes food and becomes nourishment, nourishment itself. So I think that there is here 
a sense of being a whole body. And I think from Corinthians, as you, as you mentioned very rightly, we realize that the church is a whole body, and we are all part of the same body, so that when one part of the body suffers, the entire body suffers. And so we cannot be, uh, we cannot be apathetic uh, to, to those who suffer. We are called to be compassionate. We are called to nourish one another. Once again, we are called to become Eucharistic people. I think that's the main message of the Eucharist from the biblical perspective, but also from a Christian development of the uh, theology of the Eucharist. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then, yeah. How do we as Christians take this Catholic? It makes sense as well, like Sweden. Now, there's no obvious, I mean, in terms of religious practice, probably one of the least religious countries, at least in terms of our practice in the world. Mm -hmm. And yet, in terms of the equality in society, Mm -hmm. And the lack of poverty is one of the most advanced. Mm -hmm. So how, how do we make sense of that when there's no real Eucharistic practice? Yes, I think that in that sense the, the Eucharist also helps us to open our eyes and to be open to those instances where hunger is overcome. And, and, and that's also in the case of uh, other Christian practices as Catholics to listen, to understand, to learn from other Christians, but also as Catholics and Christians to learn from other religions as well. And how hunger is overcome by other religions. That's why I mentioned this Zero Hunger Project, which is the leaders of uh, all the churches and all, uh, uh, all, all religions that come together to overcome hunger. So for them is to overcome hunger is, is to bring God to people. So even to, and I would say, the, the Eucharistic practices teaches us to, to learn how to, how, to, how to overcome hunger from secular societies as well, especially when they are preoccupied, concerned, and they are doing something practical, concrete, to overcome hunger and poverty. So I think as Catholics, as Christians, as religious people, people of faith, we have to learn, we have to open our eyes, we have to be sensitive to those instances where society, communities reach out to those who suffer the most, reach out to those who are hung hungry. So I think that societies, secular societies that are doing something for the world uh, is an example for us. It should be an example for us and we should adopt, we should learn from them and work together in, in a way that we, we no longer dichotomize once again between the secular and the religious, but we work together, we work collaboratively to overcome hung hunger and poverty in the world. I mean, I mean, I agree completely with that. And, and I mean, I, I agree with your point that, you know, without a poverty, we can't come from here. It's just a challenge for us that people say, look, on a humanistic, agnostic, sort of atheist, mm -hmm. you know, sort of state, Mm -hmm. You know, we seem to have more success ever coming from you than yes. many proclaimed, you know, Catholic nations. Yes, and that is, and I would say, we, we have to learn. We have to learn what are they doing and how we can adopt it, how can we put it into practice into our own churches. Uh, so then there is, there is, in this case, kind of an imminent, uh, uh, kind of a, a horizontal level of overcoming social, political, economic level. But there is also a deeper level of hunger, and I would say that that's when people of faith have something to say to secular societies. And that is the hunger for God, the hunger for something spiritual. And that's when the Eucharist, uh, in practices in churches, in other faiths, can say something to a secular world and say, listen, hunger is only one level, and poverty is only one level of, of society. But there is a deeper level too of a hunger, a hunger for God, a hunger for something spiritual. And I think that's where, when religion can also challenge the secular world and tell something about a deeper hunger, which is a, a desire for God. Well, I very much appreciated your insights. And I guess one uh, thing I would ask you to comment on is that if, when you look at those Hassas writings, Bach and uh, Alessandro well. yes. you see that we're also talking about a conversion in the way we see the world or the other. Mm -hmm. 
to the Indian and the African slave were seen as other. Mm -hmm. So unless there's a transformation or a conversion regarding the other, how do we have that kind of connectedness? And it would perhaps be interesting to see in Sweden how they see the other. Yes. But it plays out so often, even today, in how we portray the other, mm -hmm. which, unless there's a conversion mm -hmm. there, what follows will not be transformative. Exactly. Okay. Well, I don't have much to comment. You just said it so beautifully, because that's exactly the challenge of the Eucharist, is to embrace uh, the other so that we are all interdependent, that we are all part of the same body. And so there is no alien other anymore but we are all part of the same body of Christ. And so that's a great challenge for us because we, we tend to, to separate ourselves from these others, no? especially if they are outcasts. And so I think that's the, the great challenge, and you just put it so beautifully that I cannot, I cannot uh, underline enough uh, the way you just said it. And I think that's the great challenge of the Eucharist. We are far from there, I guess, sometimes. But we, we have to continue working on to, to, to bring the reign of God here today and not wait just for the eschatological, which is something that we are work, walking and, and, and working towards, but also the eschatology of the future is also here within us. It's possible because of our human action. Thank you. Yes, there and then there. Um, oh, it's me. Ah, sorry. Oh, it's, you and then. Oh, it's, it's me, me, is it? No, first, first lady. Oh, me. Well, John. <laughs> oh, do you mean Micheline? Oh, does it? Um, first of all, thank you very much for the, uh, for, for the talk. Enjoyed it very much. Um, you mentioned the, the superabundance of God's generosity. Um, I can well imagine people coming with certain scenarios, certainly historically, when distribution systems were let's say, not as advanced as they are today, and, and asking and presenting cases, let's say, for example, where crops failed in isolated communities and so on, um, where life seemed unremittingly hard for whole very large sectors of society. Um, even, and, you know, okay, there may have been privileged peoples within those communities, but nonetheless, things, the base level seemed very, very uh, hard. Um, could you say something about those sorts of circumstances? in yes. the context of your theology. Yes, well, in, 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 in what I develop in, in my book on, on the theology of food, I, I portray or talk about God as superabundant. Yes. And I realize that that metaphor can be paradoxical mm -hmm. and can be dangerous, especially for, for the richest societies of the northern hemisphere. And, and, but I also mention very, very uh, insistently that superabundance in God equals his generosity. So it's, it's as superabundant is God as he is generous too, because God gives completely. And so I think that teaching for those who have more, for those who live in superabundant societies, have to learn how to be generous to the others. And we are right now facing this, all these problems with these massive uh, food waste, for instance, tons of food are wasted, you know, and while there are other people who are dying of starvation. You know, and what does it mean to talk about a God who is super abundant when there is so many people in the world that are dying of hunger? So I guess for me the, the challenge would be to equal generosity as, as, as being gen uh, super abundant and also to equal in generosity. And I think there are societies in, in, in richer uh, uh, countries or in richer societies that are learning how to, how to share with others instead of just keep it for themselves. Living in Mexico, I live in Mexico City, is, is, is really atrocious, the differences between the rich and the poor. Really, I don't know if you have heard the news, but in Mexico we have the richest man in the world, more than Bill Gates. His name is Carlos Slim. But also, we have great poverty. It's incredible. I mean, how, how is it possible that in one country we can have the richest men in the world while there are so many people that are poor? And this man is really unwilling to, to share. So I think there is the challenge. And there is the sin of the world, I guess. There is the, 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 the violation, the, the violence to, to the world. And I think that's the challenge of Christianity, to, to, to share to one another. That's the main challenge.
Thank you. Thank you. Yes, here and then. Thank you very much. Uh, some of my answers were all answered by people who asked questions before me. Um, the question is a little theological because Jesus came in a manger, he was tall, and when we look at the Christmas narrative, it's very beautiful and it's very rich also. So we part of despair, but we see poverty, but it's this beautiful poverty that Jesus embraced. Yes. Jesus embraced. Uh, there is poverty, the voice is our poverty. The yes. question, and yet, in poverty there is something evil. Yes. And there is what you spoke beautifully about exploitation and suffering and injustice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you think that, um, the question is, do you think that it's because maybe some people are not aware, we as church, as we need to, mm -hmm. um, yes. are not aware that there is a spiritual poverty, like Moritz was was speaking about, this spiritual poverty is even more more than. Over. I'm not saying, I'm not denying that poverty is not yes. important, that we have to get rid of it. Yes. This is more spiritual poverty which actually imposes other poverty on people, and some people don't, are not actually aware of it. Mm -hmm. They think that it's a fatalism, it's always been like that, we always have the poverty, but some people think, and one day. Right. What is your answer? Right? Yes, excellent question. And I think Gustavo Gutierrez is very good in, in answering this question because he has done a lot of work on poverty, and he mentions very clearly that there is this evangelical poverty, no? it's a, a mystical poverty that we all Christians are called to, to become poor, no? to do this sense of kenosis even, no? not only in Jesus Christ, but also in God, there is the sense of dispossession for the sake of the other. So there is a sense of poverty even in God, uh, the Father. So I think we are all called to this sense of poverty, but at the same time, poverty in the world has these two faces. No, it has the, the face of, of the evangelical poverty that is something that is dispossessed for the sake of the other, but it's also the structural sinful poverty that we have to denounce. So there is a sense when you embrace poverty of becoming, or a call, a vocation to become prophetic when you are poor, so that you announce the poverty of the world that is the working for the other, giving yourself for the other, but, it's, but you also denounce the structure of poverty, the sin, the violence against those who are exploited. And Bartolomé de las Casas, I think, was very clear about that. And he, he went through a, 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 a whole process of metanoia himself, of conversion of the heart. And that's why he decided to free his slaves and, and then became a Dominican. And then he was preaching and it was difficult because he faced so much criticism from the church itself, from within, and then from the state even more. So that's, that's also the vocation for all Christians, to embrace poverty in a prophetic sense. That is, to announce the poverty of this possession for the sake of the other, but to denounce the poverty that is a structural sin, and violence, exploitation against those who most suffer the most vulnerable. Yes, here, and then there, and then Michael. Um, I'm not sure how these questions are going to come out, but I'm, I mean, I'm interested in, in you know, you're bringing up thinking about food and, and hunger at, at a structural level. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel like the church addresses it very downstream very often, but we don't address it upstream. And I mean, so you could look at that through thinking about the global food system that we all tap into every day in the ways in which we consume. You could think about that in terms of the, of the climate change is happening, having on like, large sections of Kenya at the moment. So, but what is, I mean, do you have examples of where the church is, or how do we mobilize people in churches in rich parts of the world that are the people kind of placing money as it circulates around the globe? Like, I feel like God feels very strongly about these, the upper end sphere, but the church has, has a, a far, less, far less to say, um, or that, that, that's helpful for people who actually sit in those places of power. Um, yes, I think there's Excellent. more yes. to be said. Definitely, definitely. When I was working on my dissertation for, for this book on food, I realized that the complexity of food, uh, I wanted to write about the Eucharist, but I realized that even before talking about the Eucharist, we have to learn what food means. You know, who do we eat with? What do we eat? What happens with the food that comes to our table? How did it come to our table? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't realize, we just take it for granted. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we take it for granted then, consequently in, in the Eucharist because we don't realize that it's a meal that is it has something to do about our food and our exchanges of food 
and how we live in the world. And food talks about or speaks about relationships. How do we relate to one another? How do we relate in the world, in the global sense? But also, as you said so nicely and so, so punctually, we, it's a relationship to the ecology. What are we doing to the planet as well? No, it's like right now with all the hormones and, and, and all the things that we put into the animals, for instance, it's horrible to eat meat right now. It wants, wants to become a vegetarian. But then also with, with vegetables as well. What are we doing with, with, with the vegetables, with, with all the, toxis, the toxis, toxicity that is in the world? So it's also food. When we look at food, we also learn something about how do we re relate to the ecology. And it's also as important to, to be aware of the ecology that is not an order for us, but it's a part of us and it's our own planet. And right now we are suffering a great deal because of all the damage that we have done to the, to, the, to the ecology. Now, the other part of the question is about what is the church doing? And I think the church is doing at the local and also at the universal level, and they are doing some things at the local level in different communities by becoming aware, by doing things related to, to helping the poor, uh, bringing food to the hungry, uh, doing uh, uh, food uh, services to, to, to those who are most outcast and and I think that's a very concrete way in which the church can help. But also at a larger way where leaders of the church are also working with the state, with nations, with other powers to overcome the hunger. And I think the church is also doing something, but we are not very fully aware, I guess, as Christians, because we don't make the connection between food that takes place in your plate and the food that you share with, in your, in your own community and the liturgical food, the liturgical meal, that, that is the Eucharist. So I think it is something that we have to realize, one, each one of us. It, it starts from within first. Each one of us, each baptized person, has to be become, has to become aware of the importance that food, that food matters. And, and, and more than that, that we are called to become Eucharistic people, to nourish one another. There was a question there, and then Michael, and then there. Yes, my, my question really was sparked off by what they said, he said about the other. And it's to do with the fact, you quoted a statistic at the beginning that 250 million people had died of hunger mm -hmm. since 1990, and most of them women and children. Yes. And that is called the feminization of power, of, of exactly. hunger, for instance. And this is what I want to, to comment on. Yes. That the, the other, the woman is the other in relation to one half of humanity. And the Catholic Church in many ways is not a particular example to look at mm -hmm. when you want to uh, talk about what Paul called there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male or female. How can we as Catholics mm -hmm. witness to this unity of which you speak? Exactly, yes. And that division still exists within our own body. And yes. How do we address it within the Eucharistic community where women are excluded? Exactly, yes. We are far from there. <laughs> but I think we are working towards, and I think new theologians are, are talking about this importance of, of, of paying attention to issues related to gender, sexuality, and, and, and race, for instance, not the other that, that has been excluded even from our churches. So I think that we have to, the process of metanoia that I was talking about, it starts first from within the church itself, yeah. so that the church becomes a witness, a test, gives testimony of this integrating of, of, of a, a, a real body of Christ, where all of us are one body with Christ and in Christ. And, and it's interesting because now the post-liberation theologians, many of them women, are taking some of the liberation theologians, but also criticizing the liberation theologians because none of them have really addressed the issue of gender, for instance. No, Marcella Altus Wright, I don't know if you have read some, some things from, from her, an Argentinian uh, theologian who recently died. She criticizes liberation theology in Argentina because she says, in, in, in Latin America, the liberation theologians were mainly men, and the concerns were very, very much male-oriented. 
and they pay very little attention to the issue of gender. And so I think that new theologians, like in this case post-liberation theologians, are talking and challenging us to be more attentive to who is the other. And it's, it's really, really uh, an, a scandal to talk about hunger and poverty, particularly when it's women. No, it's, it has been called the feminization of hunger. So what does it mean for the church? And so the church has a lot to do for, for a conversion. And it has to start from within. Michael. I'd like to join the, the chorus of gratitude for the, the reflections on the Eucharist and the cause and appreciation of the hunger that's involved in it. I think, too, the sense and even with the distinction of, of hunger that's caused by poverty, and as you're talking, what I reflected on, too, is the notion of Eucharistic fast, the, the power of fasting in our lives. Um, your talk, I think, falls into two parts. The first is the social, historical, critical element, and then the kind of theological, uh, Eucharistic. Um, I can see where some people might raise a criticism in the first part as to relying on uh, Marx's uh, uh, dialectical criticism, which um, the criticism, you know, to that might be, is that adequate? Do we possibly need something more? And by using that kind of uh, critique, does it work against the second part of your talk, <laughs> which is actually, I think, the stronger element, uh, not so much the dialectic, the, the kind of uh, division that's there, but the reality of Eucharist as, you know, this, this unity. Mm -hmm. And to the second part, my, my <laughs> reflection of my question would be, um, you didn't say anything really about diakonia, and I wonder if Eucharist can really exist without diakonia. Excellent. Very, very good questions. Well, I think, I think the, the, it would be anachronistic to, to, to talk about uh, Bartolomé de las Casas as Marxist, because I think that he preceded uh, uh, the Marxists. Uh, and also, we have precedents in the, in the pre-modern uh, uh, theologians that also talk about the need to overcome poverty, the need to overcome hunger. So I think that, uh, I don't know, I, I really don't, I'm not doing this kind of dialectical Marxist uh, approach to the Eucharist, but rather the other way around. Is the Eucharist is talking about something that overcomes these dialectics and goes beyond the dialectics, I guess, because it teaches us that we are all part of the same body. So I think that is, it could be post-Marxist, if you want, or pre-Marxist, if you want, uh, the analysis that I'm trying to give here, or bridge here, with uh, talking about the experience of conversion of Bartolomé de las Casas. Well, but to be fair, I mean, you, you really follow the critique of the, the black legend, and in terms of the Spanish uh, uh, abuses that were yes. there. And, and Bartolomé de las Casas was aware of that, yes. So, I mean, some of the things that the critique would be, I, I guess my question in that is, mm -hmm. as we approach this, what more, in terms of our analysis, to, to disclose the fullness, in terms of the, the second half of your talk, that I think is, is the, the richness to it all? Yes. What more, I think, is the co-abiding, that we abide with one another, that we have to care for one another. And I think that's beyond any Marxism or any social political analysis. I think, I think it takes it. It is not that it, it, it is a disregard, but it takes it and it, it transforms it into a new way of understanding the sense of co-abiding. And I, I think that, that touches the, the second point that you so rightly mentioned, and is the diaconia, that we are called to service to, service to one another. No, it's definitely, I, I didn't mention the word in this, in this talk, but I, I do talk uh, a little bit on my, on my book, and, and definitely we are called to service to one another. Like, like Jesus, before going to the Last Supper, he washes the feet of, of the disciples, and so we are called to also wash the feet of one another, to, to service, it's a call to service to one another. And the, the, the Eucharist is a paradigm of that diaconia, a paradigm of service to one another, particularly those who need the most. I have time for one more question. Yes. Um, 
actually it's following on from in a way from Michael's, but it's quite a simple thing really that it's it it's so difficult to as a Eucharistic community to bring Christ to the other, to the poor and the rest of it, without sometimes feeling dis a despair that you can make such little difference. And also, you have to be very conscious of the fact that it's never going to be enough to minister to other people if you're not prepared to give up things yourself. I mean, it's not a question of um, we support this and we give that to Oxfam or CAFOD or we go, but that we've got to be aware that we, as well with the planet, that we have to begin to really seriously, take seriously, giving up so the overabundance that we have ourselves. I think um, Dr. Dominic was saying that if you can't, uh, if you don't live the right kind of life yourself, mm -hmm. then you're not going to influence the people you go to, and you're not going to be able to do bring Christ to people. Yes, it is despairing sometimes when you realize the numbers, the statistics, so much to do. But I think it starts from within and in the leader actions, I think. It starts from within. In, in these leader actions, you are making already a change. And, and, it's, and as I said before, it's not just the awareness of what we are eating, how we are eating, with whom we are eating, etc. Uh, but also it has to do with caritas, with how do you practice love in your daily practices, in the everyday life. Uh, practices and so I think it's sometimes little is more you know and sometimes just a little bit is sometimes doing more than you could possibly do sometimes people who are next to you are really hungry and it's not because they are hungry of food maybe they are hungry of love and compassion tenderness something and so compassion so you can do so much just by doing it in your own everyday practices I think at this point we'll have to draw the formal part of the evening to a close. Uh, in a moment I will invite you to a little bit of co-abiding, to share a glass of wine with us or a fruit juice in the Priory Refectory. But before we do that, on your behalf, I would very much like to thank Anchor for his talk this evening. A talk which has reminded us why there is a Las Casas Institute, why we are concerned uh, for the relationship of our theology to our politics, or the theological dimension of our politics, or the political dimension of our theology, and the value of Bartolome de las Casas as an inspiration in that theological and political quest. And I'll thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.